Okay, um, thanks for coming, good morning. Uh, people have probably seen this quote. 2006, uh, Werner Vogel, the CTO of Amazon, is quoted as saying, you build it, you run it. He's referring to the small teams inside Amazon that build their different services, and the fact that if they build something, they are the ones that actually then have to run it in production and make sure if it breaks, they're the ones that fix it, if they need to change a feature, it's them, etc. And this has been used a lot over the last 12 years to talk about things like no ops and, you know, we don't really need people running it. We're going to have all the skills on one team and everything. And I'm a big fan of self-organizing teams, as you'll see here in a little bit. But that really wasn't the entire point. Um, I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but if you look at the entire context of the interview, certainly operational responsibilities was part of it. It was part of the reason that Amazon went to this model. But the real thing was they wanted to get the developers, the people on the teams, into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. It was all about the feedback loop. So it was all about getting fast feedback from your software. Not only from the perspective of, is it eating up too much memory, okay, but did our sales go up or down? If we're trying to sell books or shoes or widgets or whatever it is, and we make a change to our product, is our business get better or did it get worse? Okay, so the whole idea of you build it, you own it, or you run it, and all of those kinds of things in the self-organizing teams, again, isn't to just save money by not having as many operations people or to enable other things. It's to get us in contact with our customers to know if the software that we're using is effective. Good news is you can do this too. And this is where you get a little bit glib, uh, but I say you only have to change one thing to do the DevOps. Um, the catch is, that's everything. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I work for a tool vendor. I wish that you could download our tool and magically have, you know, continuous delivery and a DevOps culture and so forth, um, but the truth is it's not the case. There's a bunch of different parts that have to intertwine and have to work together to do this, and I'm going to go over just some of them. So some of the things I want to talk about today, um, defining or redefining words for your organization. Uh, when the, the folks that came up with the term DevOps, uh, when they came up with the term, they actively refused to define it. Because they're like, we don't want to put people in a box. We don't want to say, if you're doing these nine things, then you have a DevOps culture. Um, and so, for better or worse, that means that we all have to come up with our own definitions. There's a lot of things, as I mentioned, you have to change, and I, I need you to be open to the fact that it might actually be an organizational change. Okay, it might be the way you work as a team, the way you're organized inside your organization. You might have to re-architect your systems. You might not, but you might. Um, and the purpose of continuous del delivery, I'll get into this a bit later, is to safely deploy more often. So one of the things when we're talking about, you know, DevOps continuous delivery is, how often can I deploy, and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, the key there is safely. And I'll get into that a little bit too. So who am I? Um, I'm from Seattle. I'm currently a technical, technology evangelist at ThoughtWorks. Uh, I've been with ThoughtWorks for about 10 years in various different roles. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a DevOps Days core organizer. Uh, I also do the Seattle one. Uh, our CFP opened Monday, if you want to come speak in Seattle. Uh, and I'm Kay McGrage on Twitter. So first off, redefining words for your organization. Now, I'm going to go through some definitions and what I think DevOps is and is not, and so forth. The goal of this is not to have you uh, say, okay, this is what DevOps means. I'm going to go back to my team and say, this is what DevOps means. It's great if you want to do that. But the goal of this is so that you know what I mean when I use the words during the rest of this talk so that the communication is clear. And I encourage you to do this for your organization. If you are in team A and you tell team B that we're writing unit tests, there should be an understanding of what that means. If you say we're going to try to enable a DevOps culture, there should be an understanding of what that means. Um, and so, I mean, heck, go so far as put posters on the wall if you need to. Now to get into that though, first I'm going to say what isn't DevOps. Um, some of this might be a little controversial, but there's no such thing as a DevOps tool. Okay, because again, you know, DevOps is about culture, it's about a holistic thing, etc. cetera. Uh, that said, if you search Google for DevOps tool, you get 31 million hits. <laughs> I mean, so there are realities to there, but most of us who've been practitioners and have seen it say, you know, you can't buy DevOps. 
Apologies to anyone with the title DevOps engineer, it's also not a role. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't be a role. Um, it's also not a team. Okay, so uh, the author of the continuous delivery book, or the co-author of the continuous delivery book, um, Jez Humble, says, look, creating another silo is not a solution for silos. So one thing I like to do when I'm thinking about DevOps is think about it as verbs as opposed to nouns. So what I mean by that is it's not developers and operators. Because if you think developers and operators, that's exclusive. Well, what about security people? What about user experience? What about database people? What about, you know, whatever? But all of those roles are actually involved in developing and operating. So I like to think of it as the verbs. One of the first um, widely accepted ways to define DevOps was CAMs. So John Willis and Damon Edwards uh, in 2010, when they brought DevOps days, a lot of people know this, but the DevOps term basically was first tweeted by Andrew Clay Schaefer, and then he and Patrick Dubois and a bunch of others formed DevOps days. So congratulations, you're where the term came from. Um, John Willis was the one who brought it to the US, and he defined it. He said, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. So a lot of us, when we say like DevOps engineer or DevOps team, we're only talking about the A. We're only talking about the automation. Um, but it is culture. And by culture, I don't just mean be nice to each other. That's important. Okay, but by that, I mean things like structure and communication methods and, and those kinds of things as well. Jez Humble and, and Gene Kim and some others uh, like to inject lean in there. It's called comms instead of cams. I'm personally a big fan of this, but I don't, it wasn't in the original. Uh, most of the high performing teams that I see are not doing time box like iterative development. They are doing more of a lean flow, um, you know, work in progress, Kanban, you know, et cetera, where what's the next most important thing? Work on it, deliver it. What's the next most important thing? Work on it, deliver it. Uh, one of the measurements that John always talks about is, is idea to cha-ching. How long from I thought of it until it's making me money or saving me money or whatever. This is my definition of DevOps. Uh, I wrote one because Andrew and Patrick refused to. Um, you know, again, it's not very different. Donovan Brown from Microsoft has a very good definition that's online that I meant to create a slide for and didn't. Um, and again, the reason I, I share this is so that you know what I mean when I say DevOps. And I encourage you to either adopt one of them that's out there or create your own. As I mentioned, it might be possible or might be required to change your organization. Uh, in fact, I would say this is the most likely change. There's a lot of things I can do with you know, Monolith, which I'll get into a little bit. There's a lot of things I can do with different architectures, et cetera. But if I have a bad organizational structure when it comes to things like continuous delivery and a DevOps culture, then I'm pretty much dead. So what I mean by that is, is you know, look, if you look at the traditional model, and I'm gonna put some names on some teams here, inject your own names for yours, this is not prescriptive, but the idea is that we have people that are making the software, the development teams. Um, we have some kind of testing here. This might be security, it might be compliance, it might be you know, any number of other things. Uh, and then we have the operations team who has to actually run the thing, which is actually farther, closer to where my background is. And so what happens is the development teams come up with an idea of how to do the thing, how to make business better, and they write it, and they give it to the testing team, which may or may not have been involved in those earlier discussions. And they give it to the operations team, which is the one that's gonna get called at 3 a.m. when it breaks, not if, when, okay? Um, and now they get burnt out and they quit and we can't keep them and so forth. Because there's all these communication walls in the middle. So there's a, a, a thing that people use a lot when they're talking about software architecture called Conway's Law. Um, the paper that this comes from was written in 1967. Okay, so these are not new thoughts. But the basic idea is that a system is going to end up mirroring your organization. They were talking about infrastructure things at first, dams and nuclear power plants and those kinds of things, but it's really true for just about any system. If you have a group that does billing, there's going to be a billing module to your software. Okay? If you have a group that does testing, there's going to be a phase in your continuous delivery pipeline that they own that nobody else knows about. It just works out that way. So what we want to do is we want to try to break down these walls. Um, been doing this a little while, like I mentioned. I've been with ThoughtWorks for about 10 years, um, doing some agile stuff, but mostly continuous delivery that entire time. So I've seen a bunch of things tried. Renaming your operations team, DevOps team, 
doesn't fix it. <laughs> okay. Yes, there's different skill sets, some, the automation, the tools, and the chef and puppet and Ansible, etc. There's definitely different skills, but renaming it doesn't fix it. Also, creating a new silo that provides the automation for everybody else doesn't fix it. There is a model where this can work the, via platform type stuff, which I'll get into a little bit. But I, and again, we still have the communication problems. We talked about feedback. Uh, when I, when, when they, I submitted this talk and they said, yeah, we'd love you to come speak at Singapore, they said, and really our theme this year is feedback loops. This is what this is, what this is about. This is about getting the, the development teams, the people creating the software, closer to the customers. They're still too far from the customers here. So what I really want to do is this. What product teams? Okay, you may have heard the term products over projects. So projects, by definition, usually have a start date, a stop date, a, a scope, a budget, a, all the things. Okay, products don't. Products live on unless the product fails, and then you kill it. The team should own it. From, gee, should we do this? Through, kill it. One of the things we hear a lot. Um, when doing consulting on these kinds of things is, well, that's great, but it wouldn't work for my application because. And that's possible. If you have, like, massive monolith or what have you, it is possible. Uh, we had a customer uh, several years ago. It was a travel company. And they had a massive monolith. And if they needed to scale one part of the monolith, so let's say we need to be able to handle more hotel traffic in Singapore, they have to have to scale the entire monolith because all the functionality is in one process. So if I want to be able to handle more hotel reservations, I have to also increase my ability to handle car reservations. Well, maybe I don't need that, but now I'm paying for infrastructure to do that anyway. And oh, by the way, I can't release that unless the car thing's releasable. So there's all kinds of things with monoliths. Can you do continuous delivery with monoliths? Absolutely. Okay, but it might be hard depending on the size of yours. Now, the gut reaction here is to go Docker, 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 Kubernetes, you know, and everything. I'm going to decompose my monolith into microservices. And um, I'm a fan of that, but don't do it just to do it. And do it in a way that's, that's, I don't know, that you think about. So like in this particular example, we did break it down into microservices. Um, and by the way, if you have two things that have to be deployed together, because this version requires that version, not a microservice. Okay, if you have two things that share a database or any kind of thing like that, not a microservice. A microservice is independently deployable at any time. If you're going to do something like a breaking change, you have to version the APIs, um, etc. A microservice you should be able to deploy at any time to truly call it a microservice. Um, not that services are bad, but when I say microservice, that's what I mean. So in this case, what we do is each element of functionality is actually its own service. That allows us to distribute these across servers replicating as needed. So in the case of this customer, they were able to massively downsize their hosting infrastructure because the parts that they really had to scale, the parts that had to be high performant or whatever, were only a small percentage of the overall application. So they were able to write new services, take the monolith, change the calls to the new service, scale up the service, scale down the monolith. Saved tons of money. Not to mention, they can now react on those services faster. So part of this was the product teams. Now you have product teams that own the, these different business groups. And this gives them the ability to try different things. Like, OK, if I make this change, do reservations go up or down? If we you know, change the business in this way, et cetera. So it allows people the flexibility to, to change their part of the business to really get good, good feedback without necessarily having the other teams have to do it at the same time. So homework, a couple books, and disclaimers, these are all current or former uh, colleagues. But if you want to know more about microservices, a book called Building Microservices there. Um, evolutionary architectures is a thing that we do where we say, we try to architect things in such a way that we acknowledge we don't know what's going to be next year. So it's not about today's architecture, it's about architecting to give yourself a little bit of production. So that's all cool, but we still have to deploy somewhere. Okay, this is not magic. The software has to go somewhere. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about platforms, because I think platforms are a really enabling technology. So uh, just in case anyone is uh, not familiar with these terms, probably are, but I want to separate out things like um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, et cetera. Um, so think about a car. On-premises, 
is you bought the car. You own it, you get to replace the tires, you get to replace the, the windshield wipers, probably a lot if you live in Singapore. Um, but everything's your problem. Uh, do you have lease, car leases in Singapore? Is that a common financing thing? No? Okay. So in the US, it's very common. Uh, in a car lease, you say, okay, the car is going to be worth roughly, or not roughly, exactly, this much in three years. So I have to pay that divided by 36 per month for three years. And at the end of three years, you give it back to the, the, to the dealer. So you don't own the car. And so you're still responsible for taking care of it. You have some finance charges. If you, don't, if you damage it, it depreciates. You, know, you have to pay your own insurance, all that kind of stuff. Platform as a service is um, the taxi or the, the grab or what have you. So you, get, you, know, you, have, you, you have to pay for everything above, they pay for everything below. And then software as a service, sorry, software as a taxi, car hired is car rented. In the US we say you rent a car, you don't say you hire a car, so I get, okay. But if you rent a car, you have to pay for the fuel and stuff, but they pay for everything else. Um, although I broke down recently and they charged me, but anyway. But an example of platform as a service. Platform as a service is the part that I think is really highly enabling for the structures that we're talking about. So this is an example, it's from the US, but in the US we have an organization called cloud.gov. So there's, the, there's a rule in the US that if you're a US government agency and you want to put something on public cloud, there's 325 required security controls for compliance purposes. And you have to verify that you're meeting all of these controls. Um, 269 of them, however, if you use cloud.gov, are handled by cloud.gov. Because it's things like backups and what's the policy if a hard drive fails and you know, all of those kinds of things that can be handled by the platform. 41 were shared. And actually, the number changes a little bit whether or not you're using their app pack. But the, there's shared responsibilities in there. And 15 are now the customer's responsibility. So think of this inside your organization. I said, oh, let's move everybody onto one team, and people probably freak out a little bit. They're like, I can't have a security person on every team. I can't have a compliance person on every team. Um, a lot of that can be shifted to platforms. And platforms could be public cloud. You know, Microsoft builds a great one. You know, shout out to our hosts. Um, uh, it could be private cloud, too. I'm not saying you have to go do public cloud. There's lots of private stuff you can do as well, but platforms can be provided to make it easier to deliver the software to your customers. Because secret, there's computers somewhere. A lot of people that are in traditional operations roles, which again is closer to my background than developer, I was kind of in the middle, um, really get freaked out by some of those things. Like, wait a minute, I don't have a job anymore. I don't want to be on a product team. Yes, there's still computers. <laughs> okay, so just to be clear. Um, it's still enabling it. I mean, the cloud enables me to carry around a Surface Go because I don't have to carry any weight because I can do everything in the cloud, but it's still a computer out there somewhere. So if I look at the product teams, I'm not saying everybody in your organization is necessarily going to be on a product team. You might do something like this. You might have a platform team. These are the people that actually know how Kubernetes runs, as opposed to someone that just types Helm install, which is me. Okay, but how do I actually manage a Kubernetes cluster? How do I make sure my volumes are getting backed up? All the things, okay? Um, if it's private, it could be public. Your platform team might be Microsoft or Amazon or whoever. Okay, but somebody still has to run that infrastructure. Please don't forget these. I keep moving and like, play with you there. No. Um, you know, compliance and security, surprise, they're important. <laughs> um, and there probably aren't enough people to put one on every team, nor is there a need to put one on every team. So you might do like a matrix type organization. One of the things that, that we like to try to do, we don't, can't always do it, is put an actual auditor on a product team at the very beginning to understand the scope of the project. What is it you're playing with? What are you touching? What are the risks? What are the things? So they can tell them, well, then these are the compliance controls we need in place. Because if you don't do that, if the compliance people don't know what the product teams are doing, you end up having to check everything because we don't know what else to check. And that's where we get these 400 line spreadsheets get mailed around that nobody understands. And the person that has to rubber stamp it does exactly that. They stamp it because they don't know what row 432 means. Okay, because they're testing the wrong things, they don't know what to do. So let's talk about a little about continuous delivery. So the A in CAMS was automation, and there's a lot of things in here. Um, there's a lot of like configuration management tools and so forth. Um, continuous delivery, this is the definition from Jez Humble, who co-authored 
um, a book on the topic, so I'm not so presumptuous to try to do this one on my own. Uh, but you'll notice a couple things here. And, um, oh, I have a new toy, so I get to play with it. There's a thing here, uh, safely <laughs> and all types. Okay, so it's not only source code. It's not only application changes. It's everything. So I'm going to change the configuration. I'm going to change the version of OpenSSL. I'm going to change the tech stack in some other way. I'm going to change the way I API version, whatever. Everything goes through the pipeline. Everything gets tested. Homework, if you haven't read it, came out in 2010. So again, not new things, but. So one way to look at this is I say continuous delivery is what you do as part of a DevOps culture. So um, I was a little bit glib in the title of this talk and said, you know, what, everything, what you need to change to do the DevOps. I don't think you can do DevOps because DevOps culture. Okay, you can do continuous delivery. You can do configuration management. You can do automation. Yeah. The book? It's just called continuous delivery. <laughs> That said, there's a prerequisite. See, a lot of people that don't have good continuous integration, the testing and those kinds of things, and they skip right to continuous delivery, they skip right to deploying to production. Um, there's a thing called the State of DevOps Report that I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but came out two years ago and they measured performers and they said high performers, low performers based on how many times you, per day or how often you deploy, basically. And then correlated that with mean time to recovery, mean time between failure and so, so, and so forth. And then the next year one came out in 2017. Trying to remember, the one that just came out, is they calling that matter? They calling the one that just came out 2018 or 2019? Okay, so since 17 came out, people got better about deployment frequency. They got worse about mean time to repair and mean time to fail, between failure. So they deployed more often because that was the metric. They were saying, oh, we need to deploy more often because we want to be high performers. But the actual quality got worse. Uh, and it's because they weren't doing some of the things I'm going to talk about now. They weren't actually, you know, it's, people will drive to whatever metric. Humans are f funny. If you tell someone, this is what I'm going to measure, and you get your bonus if you do it, they're going to do it. <laughs> or it's going to look like they did it. Okay. So we talk about this thing called CI theater. It's the illusion of practicing CI while you're not actually doing it. And so, you know, we have a unit testing stage, and it has six tests. <laughs> you know, et cetera. So, these are practices, these are hard, and these are our prerequisite. You can't do any of the other stuff until you fix this. This is the one that scares me the most. Downloading Go CD or downloading Jenkins or downloading Bamboo is not the same as doing CI. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, the hotel we're in, I don't know if this is normal around here, but there's like Ferraris and Lamborghinis and everything's out front. Those are amazing cars. It doesn't make the drivers race car drivers. Okay, uh, it doesn't take a long time on YouTube to find people destroying those cars because they can't handle them. And it's the same kind of thing. Just getting the tool doesn't do it. There are practices here that are important. Um, out of the scope of this talk, but great things for open spaces. We do have a little certification test. I hate the word certification, but that's okay. We have this word certification test um, that Jez Humble and Martin Fowler put together. Basic things are every developer commits at least daily to the shared mainline. Okay, so if you have feature branches or those kinds of things that last longer than a day, you might have really good automated build and test and you're not evil, okay, but you're not doing continuous integration, full stop. Every commit triggers automated build and test. So it's not every six hours or once a day or what have you. And it's not a portion of the test. It's all the tests. And then if it fails, uh, Jez says 10 minutes. I'm not quite that strict about it. Uh, but, if they, but if it turns red, you fix it. Okay, Saying, oh, that stage is always red because we know we have a bad whatever, it's not okay. Because eventually there's going to be something else in there that failed. And you're going to think it's because of the thing you know about, and it's not going to be. Okay, so you do have to fix these things. Keep it, keep it green when you can. So the idea, again, it's all about feedback. So the pipeline, the idea is I commit code, it runs tests. Um, I don't know what this says, what this says, does build in unit tests. I don't really care what they're called. It runs fast tests. If those fail, the team gets feedback and they fix it. If they pass, it goes further into slower tests. In this case, it says automated acceptance. But again, if it fails, they fix it. 
This particular diagram, um, which is on Wikipedia, if you look up continuous delivery, has a thing in there called user acceptance tests, which are typically manual. So this is where I like to draw a difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Okay, with continuous delivery, you can deploy your software at any time. It's a business decision. With continuous deployment, you actually do. So is there a manual button or not? I believe the level of compliance testing, security testing, and every other kind of testing should be the same. Okay, it's a business thing. If you're an on-premises software, if you work for Adobe and you make Photoshop and you send me a new release every day, I'm not gonna be happy with you. Okay, but if you're SaaS, then you do continuous deployment. But that's the difference. So let's go back to our teams. How do they fit in CD? So if we look at the pipeline, we want the development team to be able to run their fast tests, run a little bit slower tests, deploy to staging, deploy to production. Okay. This rightfully scares the heck out of a lot of people. Because uh, I could write software, which you don't want me doing anymore. I used to be pretty good, but not so much anymore. Put ThoughtWorks logo on it, deploy it to Azure, and the customer wouldn't know the difference. But it might not actually be in compliance. It might not be in line with our privacy policy, et cetera. So what we want to avoid is we want to avoid deploying insecure software. We want to avoid deploying software that's not performant because slow means that you're going to go to your competitor. Non-compliance. If you do business in Europe at all and you capture user data and you can't delete it, you're in trouble. Okay? Um, and ineffective. Or did our business go up or down? How often do we deploy things and our business goes down and we don't know about it for a month? Derek Weeks from Sonatype tweeted this out. They did a study. People that are using Maven Central, which is a, how you do public a lot of Java projects. So you, you type Maven build, it downloads the internet, runs it. Roughly 23% of the things downloaded have known vulnerabilities. And there are simple tools to test this. There's simple tools to make sure that the, at least there's not anything known. You can't prove something's secure, but you can say if something's known about it. Okay? Test this stuff, please. Because the purpose of a continuous delivery pipeline is to kill a release candidate. Full stop. It's the only purpose. Every time you commit code, every time you make a change, that's a release candidate. It's the pipeline's job to prove it's not good enough. Because you can't prove something's good. Okay? You can't prove something's secure. But I can prove it's not good or not secure. So if we go back to our pipeline, what I want to encourage you to consider is doing other things in parallel. These might be completely different groups in your organization. They might be completely different code bases. They might be you know, all kinds of different things. But you know, I can run in parallel. Don't slow down your dev teams, because that is necessary. They need that feedback. Okay? But when they build a new jar, grab it into your pipeline. Run some security tests on it. Okay? If they build a new Docker container, grab it into your compliance pipeline. Run server spec or inspec on it. Okay? Don't let them deploy to production if those don't pass, but let them do all the other things. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there, you, you, can't, you can't buy a tool. Okay? You can't hire a consultant. This is work. Um, people ask me, well, how long does it take from this to this? 18 months? I don't know. Maybe three, maybe 24. It depends on your organization. But this is work. There are things that have to be done here. There's not a silver bullet. But the good news is these are solved problems. So there's a bunch of books out there to help with some of this stuff. Um, these are just some that, that I recommend um, that will help you read some of the things about it. Things like DevOps days in the open spaces this afternoon. Uh, I couldn't agree with what Sergio said more, that open spaces are the real power of DevOps days. It's the power for you all to talk to each other and say, well, I had this problem. How did, how did you fix it? How did, you know, et cetera. For you to ask us, hey, have you seen this, et cetera. That's the power of a DevOps days. I mean, I'm happy to talk to you, but I'm talking at you. I'm not talking with you. Okay, so take some of these things to the open spaces this afternoon. So summary, it's important that you agree on definitions. I can't say that I did a unit test and have somebody else misunderstand what that is and we're just gonna, it's not gonna work. So agree on your definitions. You might have to do org changes, apologize to the managers and do another restructuring, but it might be required. Modern architectures, I'm time, so. <laughs> Uh, continuous delivery will help you deploy more often, but don't make deploy more often your metric, please. Um, that's the one thing I don't like about the state of DevOps report is they say, um, actually they fixed it this year, now they say deploy on demand is elite. Um, deploying every hour is not a thing unless that's important to your business. Okay? If it is important to your business, awesome. But please don't make it the metric for the sake of making it the metric. And with that, I'll say thank you.
and there is no chance I can read those. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Yep. Um, so we have some active questions on the feature call, so that, that's amazing. We start interacting. So the first question, I'm going to read it out loud to you, Ken. The product team approach is great, but how do we maintain the cost to make sustainable business will while adding more and more people and team is costly, especially in microservices feature team approach? Uh, okay, so I'm going to make some assumptions on the question just for the sake of time. I, I think what we're talking about is that, well, we always come up with new features and new products, and yet if now one team owns one, now they own six, now they own 12, now they own what have you. Um, that's where one model, I didn't want to go into too much on this talk, but um, if you look at uh, like the SRE concept, and there's some talks about SRE, but one of the ways I understand it is product teams can earn the right, that's the important part, to have somebody else run that service. So if I create a new service, and it's not going through a lot of changes, and it's stable, and it's re reaching my metrics, and et cetera, then I've earned the right to have the system reliability team run that now, and if there's a problem, it still comes back to me, but it's not my full-time job every day. Uh, if it starts getting flaky or I start doing changes, then it gets right back to you. But there's ways to scale that out. And again, great open space concept uh, uh, topic. Okay, uh, second question. In a, startup, in a startup environment, how do you incorporate product teams? Depends on the startup. You might not, you, your, okay, so your, your startup environment, that, that might be the product team. Uh, an example I use is, is we had a tool that we no longer have, which I don't like, uh, but we had a tool that was a SaaS uh, CI platform. And when it was a product team that started it, and when they started it, they thought, okay, let's be fancy. And they made it into a bunch of microservices and everything else, but the truth is they didn't know their business context yet. They didn't know where the API should be and what the communication method should be and so forth. Uh, and it ended up being uh, just nasty. Uh, I don't remember who originally said the quote, but it's like, I changed from a monolith to microservices, and now every outage is a murder mystery. Okay, things would go wrong and they couldn't figure it out. And so they ended up re-architecting it back to a monolith. Okay, but it was this very small monolith and it's a product team and it's what have you. So if you're a startup and you're a single product organization, you already are a product team. And it might be that team that owns each of the services, et cetera. I'm not saying you have to have a bunch of two-person teams. Uh, the real thing is the ownership, that the people who are creating the code are the people that are getting the feedback from the customer and from the, the platform. Is, is it performance and all that kind of stuff. Hey. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. Uh, we actually fit 